I'm Jim Chuck. You're watching Kelowna Now. Today I have with me Sonia Firstino of the BC Green Party, the leader of the BC Green Party. Thank you for coming on. Delighted to be here, Jim. Yeah, so uh, it's kind of an interesting election for sure. The Green Party is now leading the opposition party in many polls. What, what do you have to say to that? Yeah, you know, I, I pay not that much attention to the polling. I really focus on uh, ensuring that we have really good candidates. Uh, we approach the elections and uh, candidates as representatives for their community. So finding people that have already been doing really good work in their communities, finding people that are standing up for people. And then uh, our platform, of course, will come out once the election uh, ha starts happening after September 21st. And um, we are going to present a vision for the province that I'm, I'm very excited to share. And I think we, we add a very important aspect to the conversation. We've, we work really hard to hold the government accountable, even with two MLAs, and to bring issues and ideas and policies that other parties aren't talking about. So we're going to continue playing that role. Of all the ridings in BC, what is there, 81? I'm, 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 I get that number no, wrong. 90, 93 now. There are 87, but uh, okay. we've had the changes to the electoral boundary, so 93. 93. So how many candidates do you have? Do you have a candidate in every riding or are you focusing on certain ridings? We're certainly aiming to have a, a full slate of candidates and uh, we have a whole bunch of announcements coming up and uh, our goal is to get as close to 93 as we can. And then recognizing that, of course, there are a, a handful of ridings that we're very strong in and we're going to work very hard to get MLAs elected in those ridings. So what do you make of um, former leader of the Green Party, Andrew Weaver's comments about John Rustad and, and the rise of the BC Conservative Party and kind of, uh, and then the, the fall, I guess, in the polls, in the polls with the BC United Party. You know, I, I spend a lot of time talking to people right now. I'm, I'm doing a lot of door knocking, a lot of canvassing, a lot of time just listening to what people have to say. People are really angry and frustrated with a government that is spending a lot of money, the NDP has the largest budget in BC's history, $89 billion. And yet we're seeing services and outcomes really not match that level of investment. I totally share that level of frustration and anger. What I uh, am proposing, what I think is very different from John Rusted and the Conservatives, are costed, uh, informed, and serious solutions to the problems that we're facing. Um, for example, with healthcare, we've spent years delving into health policy um, and we've landed uh, with a pretty clear understanding that if we're going to make significant changes to the healthcare system, it has to start with primary care. We need everybody in this province to have attachment to primary care. And the way we do that is through team-based care community health centers. Um, and so we could turn around the healthcare crisis really quickly if we invested the money in the right places and not in more bureaucracy, not in more red tape. Um, but the, the, the frustration and the anger, I think, is really fueling where, where people are looking. And then I'm really hopeful that as we present what are serious solutions to the very serious problems we're facing, they'll recognize that somebody who is saying that climate change isn't a serious risk, somebody who's uh, wanting to take us backwards on reconciliation efforts when in fact the courts, the Supreme Court of Canada has made it very clear that governments have a responsibility to negotiate uh, agreements with First Nations. Um, somebody who is really turning to, you know, not very, uh, not very good kind of politics where you point at people and, and you try to be divisive and hateful. We don't have the, the time to be doing that when we have the challenges that we're facing right now. So the, the NDP seems to want to paint John Rostad and his party as extremist. Uh, they've even said Trumpian and, and, and stuff like that. But the, lately the actions of and the comments on some of the from John Rostad, I mean, Eleanor Sturko, um, joining the party, uh, and just recently Gavin Dew, which you would probably uh, label as a progressive conservative. Um, mm -hmm. 
And then, you know, like the, the comments from Andrew Weaver that seems to think that John Rustad's willing to listen, it doesn't really line up with what the NDP is trying to paint him as. And so where do you, you think he fits in the spectrum now? Because I, I, I hear your comments on that he doesn't believe in climate change. But then mm -hmm. it seems like people like Gavin do, obviously, we just interviewed him and he and he seems to recognize climate change. So he is bringing people into the party that have, you know, recognized that there's some, you know, important things to consider. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think that politics, you know, really should be uh, an ongoing conversation about the world we're in and how we're going to solve these problems and the vision that we have for the future. Uh, that conversation obviously gets uh, more highlighted in times of elections. Uh, and I think that it, I would like us to focus more on not personalities and not, uh, you know, trying to convince people to be afraid, but focus more on what are the concrete solutions that these parties are offering and, and how can we make them happen? Yeah, to say to people that voting a certain way is a threat to democracy is kind of... Um, the real threat to democracy by telling people they don't can't exercise their yeah. vote, right? So, yeah. I mean, we, that is the basis of democracy, is it not? It, it absolutely is, Jim. And I think what, what political parties should focus on is giving people something to vote for, get people excited about a vision, get people excited about the idea that we can, we absolutely can and have to solve these crises. We have to be able to depend on government to deliver the services that they are tasked with delivering, healthcare, education, infrastructure, uh, social services, housing, affordable housing. These are the jobs that government has to be doing. And when they fail to do it, people start looking elsewhere. Instead of telling everybody to be afraid, I would like all the parties to focus on how are you going to solve this? What are your solutions? I think that's a good message for everybody to hear and, and really let that resonate in their mind. I'm going to bring it around to the Okanagan. Um, mm -hmm. Wildfires, big part of what we face here, hurts tourism and hurts like people lose homes and that. And we've been seeing more and more wildfires. Climate is a big part of, of, of you know the BC Green Party. How mm -hmm. do you want to tackle wildfires? I mean, I've, I've done so many interviews with forestry companies saying that they're not allowed to cut to manage the forest, which would mitigate some of the, the, the wildfires. How, how do we deal with wildfire in a way that it's it's good for the citizens of, of British Columbia and also good for the climate? Yeah, it's such it's it's one of the most important questions we have right now in this province because I, you know, I was in Kelowna last August, uh, the day that that fire uh, took off, and uh, it was it was terrifying. And I, you know, my. Um, people in the interior, in the southeast, and now in the north and northeast are uh, really having to suffer the consequences of summer after summer of wildfires, the smoke we put out an air quality piece of legislation that would at least give some people some protection from the, the air pollution and ensure that there's indoor air spaces that people can go to when, when the air quality is so poor. But when it comes to how are we going to deal with, uh, with wildfires, we have to step back and look at, we had the Abbott Chapman report in 2018, uh, uh, George Abbott, Maureen Chapman. And in that report, they really laid out, this is a bottom up approach. We need to empower communities. We need to ensure that the investments and the resources are going to communities on the ground to be able to create uh, far better and safer conditions, both when it comes to wildfire and to flooding. We have the latest report out, I've just got it in front of me, um, from the Wildfire Resilience Project on the state of wildfire in BC. And while we uh, might wanna look for simple answers, uh, continuing to clear cut and plant uh, monocultures and plantations is not the answer. Um, we need to uh, look at the landscape and ask, how do we make it more resilient, more biodiversity, uh, more cultural and preventative burning uh, is a big part of this, but also ensuring that communities are getting those resources to be able to mitigate and reduce the risk of wildfires on a year round basis. We can't just wait for these fires to happen and then say, what do we do? We have to take this on and treat it like the emergency it is. These wildfire seasons are not going to just end. We know that the temperatures, we had just had a report come out this week that the increased temperatures as a result of climate change are making wildfires and droughts worse. 
Uh, and uh, we, we have to start with the reality that we're in and then say, how do we step by step get to a place where uh, this is not the reality anymore? And it's, it's, a, it's a significant project, um, but it, it, takes, it has to start with understanding the landscape, working with First Nations, Indigenous cultural understanding of the landscape. 10,000 years, uh, Indigenous peoples have, have worked in, uh, in harmony with nature to, to mitigate these risks. Uh, and then invest and empower local communities to be able to do the work on the ground. 94% of the, the forests are on Crown land and that's the responsibility of the BC government. And um, CO2 carbon emissions are they're the leading um, contributor is, is, is forest fires. Yeah. So, and then, like I said, I talked to many forestry companies, I've talked to so many people and they and they say that it's mismanagement that the forestry industry is in shambles and all that stuff. Do you agree with that? That they've done a really bad job in managing our forests. And do you think uh, the people in the lower mainland, in that they're in the in a wetter climate, they don't really see the problems that we face in the rest of British Columbia contributes to yeah. that? Jim, I agree wholeheartedly. We have mismanaged the forests, and it doesn't matter which government has been in power in this province that mismanagement has been the nature of how the land has been used. It's not just mismanaged in terms of the ecosystems and the forest resiliency and the watershed protection and all of that. It's mismanaged in terms of jobs. And so allowing for uh, heavy industrial machinery to be clear cutting forests means that there are fewer and fewer jobs coming off of the, the resource extraction on the land. Uh, Removing a pertinency, meaning that um, the the timber that's harvested does not have to go to local mills. Uh, we've seen mills shut down in this province uh, decade over decade, uh, and allowing for raw raw lumber, raw resources, raw trees to be exported uh, from BC without those value added jobs and uh, manufacturing pieces is mismanagement. It's mismanagement from the beginning to the end. And we have to take seriously that the role of the, of the government is not just to protect the, the profit making of big industry, it's to protect the communities, the workers, the long-term long -term sustainability of these forests so that they are uh, a resource that benefits British Columbia now and into the future. And we have taken this, you know, all at once approach to forests in this province, and we are now paying the price of that mismanagement. Yeah. You talk about jobs and forestry and, and sawmills, especially. When the NDP took power, there were six operating mills in Merritt. There's zero operating there today. Uh, Canfor pulled back big investment in Houston, closed Bear Lake, and then also cut shifts in, in Prince George. And it seems like there's a big difference between what's happening in British Columbia and what's happening in Alberta. Their, their industry is expanding. Ours is, is falling behind. Um, and like all those jobs lost. And, and, then, and then they're saying, even in, in Merritt, they're saying that even the pine beetle kill and the burnt trees, they can't get permits to take those trees out, which is basically just dry tinder for, for, for future fires. And, and they're very frustrated as well. Yeah, and again, I think that the the answer to this is uh, empowering communities on the ground to be able to ensure that the decisions that are being made make sense for the regions and the communities that are affected by those decisions. But we have to take into account more than just uh, the the way that the resource can contribute to economic activity, we have to look at a whole bunch of values when we're looking at long-term forestry sustainability, long-term economic sustainability. And uh, we've really, you know, we've really gotten ourselves to a place where um, there's, there's not uh, the capacity of these forests to provide the, the the benefits that they should be to communities, and we have to look at different models. Uh, community forests are are a model that that exists some places in the province where those economic benefits really stay in the community. Um, having a, prov a provincial government that really recognizes the the way in which we can transform 
our economic activity so that local communities are insured of benefit and wealth back from that activity has to be front of mind, but recognizing as well, um, it's not the mid 20th century anymore. We are in a very different world from when these forestry practices were put into place and we have to adapt to the world that we're in today. Are we better off to incentivize people to make changes to greener solutions like solar and EVs and that instead of punishing them with a carbon tax? We see in, in China, for instance, the, uh, their adoption rate of EVs is over 50 percent now and, mm -hmm. and they don't have a carbon tax. The United States doesn't have a carbon tax. So, and there's people that say the carbon tax hurts the people that can least afford it the most, right? So are these yeah. carbon taxes necessary or should we spend more of that energy on incentivizing and educating the public? You know, the, the carbon tax, as it was originally thought about by economists, by really conservative economists, um, was to put the tax at the source of pollution, at the wellhead, at the mine site, um, and take those, those uh, revenues Profits, from yeah. the and return those to people uh, and put them into uh, the transformation of the, of the economy um, as a way of incentivizing what we want to see, invest in solar, invest in an EV, um, and disincentivizing what we don't want to see, more pollution, more carbon. The, it's, it's unbelievable. We've actually, in, we have the inverse of that in BC. Industry gets a break on carbon tanks, um, and the most polluting industries pay the lowest carbon tax and people are having to, to take the brunt of it and not, uh, you know, not get the benefits that they should. We need a complete overhaul of this so that the price on carbon pollution is at the right place, at the source of that pollution, and that the people are actually benefiting from that carbon pricing, not paying it. And I, I'm so disappointed with how uh, upside down, and in particular in the last few years under the NDP, this has become. And uh, people have lost trust, people don't have uh, you know, confidence that this is working, and, and I don't blame them because uh, we've really had a government that has dropped the ball on how to effectively put a price on, on carbon pollution so that it incentivizes what we want and disincentivizes what we don't want. I, I think they politicize it so much that there's the people on one side that just resist solar and EVs, even though it might be cheaper, better, faster, because they see it as a, a political wedge that they're being told to do something when the, the energy would be better spent in education and showing yeah. people the better way. Um, what would you do if, if the Greens um, assumed uh, government would you would you scrap the carbon tax at the pump? Because there's there's people right now choosing between what they get for dinner and, and how much money they can put in their car, and and yeah. and put that tax back at the at the at the source, and then incentivize the public to do better things. Yeah, we we actually have a, a whole platform plank on on reforming taxes generally. Uh, including reforming how the carbon tax is working because it's not it's not working the way it's supposed to be working and it is punishing the wrong people it's well it's punishing people so we have to put people at the center of this we have to put people and their well-being particularly in the situation we have right now where cost of living is so hard for most people in this province um, and we also we have a we have a lot of unfairness in our tax system that the we have a very low tax rates for the wealthiest we have no wealth tax in it to speak of uh essentially in bc um there's ways that we can reform the tax system so that um people who are at the bottom and in the middle are not bearing the heaviest weight and heaviest burden of taxes in this province and uh so we've got a whole plan for that and yes Yes, the carbon tax needs to be reformed. I've been a, a strong advocate for that. Um, and we need to, we, for example, revenues um, should be not only coming back to people to help uh, address the affordability crisis, 
but to communities to build that resilience to droughts, to wildfires, to floods, so that we are actually building stronger, more resilient communities uh, and getting out in front of this battering that we are experiencing in this province uh, in every season of the year. I have two questions left for you. One of them is the inflation report came out today, 2.6, but if you take energy out and the interest rate uh, effect, mm -hmm it would actually probably be negative. Like, it seems odd that they continue to say that the carbon tax is necessary, that it does contribute to inflation, but it, it clearly energy goes into everything we eat and do and everything we do all day. So it, it is contributing to inflation. And um, how would mm -hmm. you, if, if we could remove that, do you think that would put more money back in the pockets of people? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's really important. We've been calling for a windfall profits tax. I was just looking at the profits of Shell, which is one of the owners of the co-owners of the LNG Canada project. Twenty six billion dollars in profits, not revenues, in profits. And uh, until governments have the backbone to say that multinational corporations and industries cannot extract that amount of profit without being expected to pay some appropriate level of taxes that can then be used to, to buffer the burden of these uh, out of control expenses for people. Um, we're going to keep seeing the same trends. We have seen, Jim, an absolutely massive transfer of wealth in the last four years. Uh, where the billionaire class, the billionaires that used to have a collective wealth in the tens of billions now have a collective wealth over $12 trillion. And until we have politicians that are willing to talk about the inequality that has been allowed to happen in the last four years in, in not just in BC, in Canada and around the world, because governments have sat back and let companies and corporations take massive, massive profits at the expense of regular people, um, we're going to see this continuing pain that people are feeling. We need governments to step in and play that role that they're supposed to pay, play in protecting people and not allowing this kind of uh, uh, incredibly outrageous profit taking at the expense of people. Well, we see a lot of corporate welfare being doled out both at the provincial and federal level as well. And then the 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 consumer ends up paying more tax and, and it, but it seems yeah. like we're, we're able to dole out billions of dollars to, you know, somebody that's going to put a plant in here and there. And, and a lot of the, <laughs> and then a lot of automation going on. And it's actually a loss of jobs in many cases. Um, yeah. The, the, the last question I have for you today is that we, I think we did a story yesterday. Um, the standard of living in Canada has dropped in the past year. And then BC was one of the worst places. Um, yeah. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I, I do. And I think, you know, I'm, I was born in 1970. I grew up in a country where we had a social safety net, where we had governments that invested in excellent public education and health care and infrastructure and transit. And those are the ways that governments can ensure that there is a baseline of standard of living for everybody. Uh, investing in, in affordable housing. We had uh, the last 40 years, we are now paying the price of that loss of investment in co-op and non-market housing. Um, the way that governments can play a role in ensuring that standard of living for people does not drop uh, is to ensure that there is uh, accessible, reliable, affordable public transit, that there is childcare, that there is excellent public education, that we can count on a healthcare system to be there when we need it and not have to contemplate spending tens of thousands of dollars to go elsewhere to get the healthcare that we have been paying taxes for. Um, we have a significant problem with governments not delivering the services that they are paid for paid by us to deliver. And those services are meant to be that, that baseline to ensure that there is a decent standard of living for all Canadians. And uh, we need to ensure that governments are, are doing their job. And that's what we're gonna put forward in our platform is ways that we can affordably, effectively, uh, responsibly 
solve these problems and actually end up saving money, not just for people, but for governments. So when can we see your platform? Um, and then when can we see your full slate of candidates? When, when do we yeah. expect that, that timeline? Yeah, the full slate of candidates, I, uh, we have a, a small and very hardworking field team that is, is getting that full slate of candidates. Hopefully by uh, mid-September, we'll be able to have uh, almost all of our candidates announced. And we will be releasing our platform early into the election writ period so that all British Columbians can see the vision that we have for BC. If, if you end up in an Andrew Weaver situation where you can actually form the government with the other party, which party would you rather that be? Look, I, am, I, I call this, Jim, since I've been involved in politics, it's been uh, 10 years since I was elected as a local area director and seven years since I've been an MLA. And I say, it's the everybody to the table method. Um, I, we built a leadership team in Cowichan, had the MP, the MLA, the mayors, chief of Cowichan tribes from the entire political spectrum across all jurisdictions. And it's amazing how many problems you can solve when you sit down at a table and are willing to listen and put those solutions forward and then move forward with them. For me, it is everyone to the table. We have so many overlapping crises that we have to move beyond this old style of politics that says, I just absolutely refuse to work with this person or that person. And we have to find ways to work together so that we are serving the people we're supposed to serve. And that is every British Columbian. That's some refreshing messages from you. It's, it's great to hear. Um, that's all I have. Is there anything else that you want to add to speak to the people of the Central Okanagan? Anything that you want to leave them with? Um, well, one, I really appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation with you, Jim, and happy to happy to carry it on any time. Um, to the people of Central Okanagan, and you live in a, a spectacularly beautiful, but a place that has really been battered in the last several years by the impacts of climate change. And what you need uh, is uh, a government that's willing to work with your communities, not tell you what is needed and what to do, but to really work from the ground up to, to put the solutions and get going on those solutions as fast as we can. We can do so much if we focus our, our energy and attention and resources in the right places. Well, I wish you well, and, I, and I'm sure we'll talk again. We'd like to have you on more often. I think your voice needs to be heard. Thank you, Jim. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. And okay. thank you for watching Kelowna Now.